If you've been following my channel for a while, you might know I've been on a bit of an apology tour. To put it simply, at one point, I was guilty of spreading misinformation. I had played the numerous titles released by the AAA industry under the supposed banner of survival horror and found each and every one to be so far from the mark that I eventually lost faith that anyone even knew how to make these games anymore. It was almost like the only people who did at one point had exited the industry, leaving behind only those who would mimic their work without really understanding how to go about completing such a Herculean task. Well, it turns out I was wrong. Or I guess you could say I was looking in the wrong place. The whole time I was screaming my head off about the death of the genre, titles were still being pumped out. They were just smaller games made by even smaller studios. It was honestly a little surreal finding out that the indie market had unbeknownst to me revived my beloved survival horror right under my nose. So I endeavored to go on a bit of a quest to enjoy all of the modern titles in the genre I had been missing out on and in that process came across a demo for Signalis, a dark, moody, and insanely interesting horror game that seemed to check every box Capcom created when popularizing these types of games. And now that the full game's out, we've got one question to answer here. Does Signalis as a finished product live up to all the praise and admiration I gave its short demo? Well, I think it's about time I do exactly that. What's up guys, I'm Jared, and this is Avalanche Reviews. After first getting my hands on Signalis in the form of its free demo, I was immediately smitten. Not only was it displaying all of the hallmarks of a great horror title, but the developers really seemed to understand what made the survival horror genre so great. And since we mentioned the devs, I was pretty blown away to find that Signalis was the result of just two people's hard work. A duo based out of Germany put together every single aspect of this game minus the music, and to say that's impressive would be one hell of an understatement. I mean seriously, I still would have been wowed if I had thought a team of 10 to 20 people hammered it out. It looks to me like both members of Team Rose Engine are illustrators, which really shows because this is a game that fully integrates its presentation into the core of its experience. Its visual style is insanely fresh in the horror space, to say the least, and its look seems to be driven by a theoretical threesome between the movie Alien, Capcom's Resident Evil, and the anime Ergo Proxy. All good pulls to be drawing inspiration from, in my opinion. After getting that first little peek of what this team could offer in my modern RE clone video series, I was beyond excited to see this thing hit the market, and as luck would have it, I wouldn't have to wait very long at all. And this is where, in the spirit of full disclosure, I do want to say that I was provided a pre-release copy of the PC version of Signalis by Rose Engine themselves. I also want to assure you that this was not done to secure a positive review from me, and I promise to be my normal, absolutely impossible to please self for the duration of this video. I however cannot promise you that I wasn't already biased towards this game even before getting early access to it. Ever since first getting my hands on that demo, I have been following this game's development like a hawk. I even popped into its Japanese distributor Playism's booth at Tokyo Game Show this year just to see if there were any differences between the Japanese and US demos. Sadly, I didn't find any, but big ups to the nice guy who broke the rules and let me have two Signalis pins instead of one. Not all heroes wear capes. As far as story is concerned, Signala seems to have a lot of elements that might remind you of other equally awesome properties. There's a very clear, dreamy, almost Lynchian feel to its events that seems to flirt with a bit of Dune at points, but the psychological elements definitely points towards an appreciation of the Silent Hill series. Throughout the game, I was constantly questioning if what I was seeing was actually happening or some kind of a fever dream, and to be totally honest with you, the jury's still sort of out on that one. The developers describe Signalis' story as a dream about dreaming, and I would say that paints a much better picture of the overall effect this thing had on me better than I could. There are also Lovecraftian overtones with elements of forbidden knowledge that can have a maddening effect on whoever possesses it. And really, if your story is combining influences of Lynch and Lovecraft, you're probably doing something correct here. But enough with the descriptions and comparisons, let's start with the stuff I can actually nail down. In Signalis, you play as Elster, or at the very least, an Elster unit. 
part of a line of machines made to better the human experience by doing manual labor, policing, administrative work, and leading expeditions to other worlds. Our specific Elster was on one such expedition with the goal of finding and identifying new inhabitable worlds. The game starts with Elster waking up to the news that her ship at some point had crash-landed on a snow-covered planet, and as she searches the wreckage, she finds her partner is missing. After making it out of the ship, we follow a trail of wreckage that leads us to some sort of a mining facility, and once inside, Elster finds the place to be almost abandoned. What few people there are to actually talk to aren't people at all, but instead replicas like herself. And if that's not bad enough, they all keep telling her not to go any further. It seems like this place might be a little more dangerous than it seemed at first, which is really saying something because it is a mining colony on an ice planet. Well, this is a horror game, so we're obviously not going to heed that advice, and as we continue to look around, we find scattered documents and first-hand accounts that paint a story of a viral outbreak that has killed off the humans that work here, or used to work here. The effects it has on the replicas, however, are a little more gruesome. Since these guys are essentially robots on the inside, they can continue to function even if they get the virus, but they are also made up of lab-grown organic components like skin and select organs. And those organic parts, as you might imagine, are where all the problems lie. When infected, replica skin will start to develop lesions that soon turn into cancerous growths, and eventually their more human parts become corrupted, including their mostly organic brains. After things get that bad, the replica essentially turns into a monstrous form that has subsequently lost its mind. These things lash out at anything they could get their hands on, and thanks to the more mechanical elements of their makeup, keeping them down is not exactly an easy task. As Elster makes her way further and further into the work camp, she starts to piece together a rough idea of the series of events that ended in this nasty situation, but information on her partner seems to be hard to come by. She does, however, come across a scant few replicas left unscathed by the virus, but they offer no real help and in one situation even directly halts her progress. Now, this may sound pretty simple to you, and that's because it's a summary of the more, let's say, concrete elements of Signalis' story. Essentially, I've just given you a lot of the major beats, but in between these little disparate details lies a lot of cosmic horror imagery and psychological elements that makes me doubt a lot of the events that take place here. There are sections where Elster will find herself reliving flashbacks to events that never happened to her, and after waking up, the items gained in that flashback will be in her inventory. There is a lot that you'll experience here that's going to make you question what you do and do not know about this game's story, and that seems to be very much an intentional feature as far as the developer's pre-release info is concerned. Now, I will admit, when someone starts talking about elements like this, it is pretty easy to assume this is one of those form-over-function stories. You know, the kind that seems to act more as an advertising campaign for its writer's esoteric taste in art than a complete tale that the player is supposed to be able to understand. Well, I can assure you that is not the case here, which isn't to say this thing is straightforward, actually far from it. Like I said before, I spent a good chunk of the game questioning what exactly was going on, but rest assured there is one hell of an emotional payoff at the end of this rabbit hole. Much like your more average, more old Silent Hill game, there's a story here that can certainly be sped through and still be appreciated to a degree, but someone who takes their time and reads into the pages and pages of lore scattered around the game is going to engage with it on a much deeper level. For example, at one point in the game, I kept coming across these top secret documents pertaining to the different replica models. They detailed everything from what jobs they were custom built for to how each of their personalities worked. I'm not going to ruin any of the deeper stuff for those that want to dig into that information like I did, but the TLDR here is that humanity was at a technological level that would allow them to create labor cyborgs, I guess, but they still couldn't conquer the sheer complexity of the human mind. So instead of trying to, they just vat grew brains and used electronics to alter them. And for a very interesting reason, each replica in a series will have the same exact personality. Some are going to be more empathetic and others more prone to antisocial behavior. Each one of these little manuals included advice on how to keep the replicas functioning well mentally and included steps that could be taken if one started to show signs of any kind of personality degradation. And I really mean it when I say that I sat down and read every single one of these. It was honestly amazing. I couldn't stop reading this stuff and it really didn't have anything to do with the main story. It just told me a little bit about the replicas that I was seeing covered in cancerous tumors. 
It's sort of like coming across a psychiatrist evaluation of every zombie that you shot in the face that used to be a person in Resident Evil. There were tons of little moments like this when Signalis, without really giving me any of its main story, got me even more interested in its world and how it typically operated. Just from getting my hands on personal logs and records of how the chain of command worked, I could see that humans in this world were highly authoritarian and vertically integrated. The government assigns jobs to civilians and military service seems to be mandatory. This game is just dripping with world building flavor text and I really couldn't love it more. Aside from the auxiliary stuff though, I really found myself engrossed in this story. It kept a lot of its bigger story beats close to the chest for a very long time, but it has this really interesting Silent Hill-esque framework. As I'd be wondering about a specific detail, the game would introduce a few more vague ideas to get me interested in, so by the time it had revealed whatever I was curious about first, I had already formed even more questions. Honestly, I can't wait for the story analysis videos to hit YouTube because, like I said, I did grasp most of what was going on here, but there are the more surreal elements that feel more like a, well, what do you think they mean kind of deal. Now, to be fair to myself, I didn't exactly have infinite time with this one, so there are no doubt a few elements that went over my head or some I didn't even notice. And at the end, I found out there's more than one ending, which makes me really excited to jump back in because it gives me another incentive to go in and try to find all that stuff I missed. For a guy like me, this is a really nice place for a story to be, just barely straddling that razor-thin line between meaningful storytelling and full-on, up-to-your-interpretation, arthouse dream logic. When I finally got to the end of Signalis, I was sitting here in my room with all the lights off, just basking in the reflected glow my monitor cast on the walls, and the events I saw really resonated with me. It's one of those endings that makes you stay silent for a bit and spend a few minutes analyzing all the emotions it just stirred up in you. Hell, the next day I called my wife into the room, gave her the Cliff Notes version of the story, and then made her watch the ending just so I wasn't the only one in the house catching feelings over a video game. This really is the total package in my mind. It has this fully understandable and emotionally deep narrative going on, but it's all surrounded by these ethereal elements like the Lovecraftian bordering on supernatural events and odd imagery used to invoke a very cool effect where you start to feel certain things and you're not exactly sure why. It's like you don't really understand what you're looking at, but without being aware, it's having some kind of a subconscious effect on you. If you held a gun to my head, I could probably come up with a few nitpicks here or there, but as far as this critique goes, the only possible downside I could see a potential player running into is the slow burn Signalis can be story-wise. Now that's not to say you won't be engaging with the story for long stretches, in fact it's quite the opposite. Throughout my 11 hours with the game, there were a refreshingly numerous amount of cutscenes, but Signalis is the type of game where you're given a lot of disparate story details, sometimes out of order, and they're not going to turn into something concrete and tangible until those final pieces fall into place. So while you do learn all kinds of stuff about the story you're interacting with, you'll spend long swaths of the game not really knowing exactly what's going on, despite having at least most of what you need to put it all together. On the plus side though, that aha feeling when things start to finally fall into place in your head, that's incredibly satisfying. Besides, I get the feeling this was very much done on purpose and you do have to appreciate when a developer risks potential short-term gains for a massive payoff in the end. And I think the word payoff is very fitting here because in the end, this is what I would call one damn well-fashioned game story. It weaves together so many differing elements and all of them perfectly combine into a singularly awesome thread. Mostly though, I enjoyed the dueling nature of the concrete, identifiable story elements sharing equal billing with the more liquid, dream logic, and jarring psychological stuff. It's like the perfect middle ground between something like Event Horizon and Jacob's Ladder. I feel like someone trying to get what they want out of this game could very easily engage with both of these pieces of the whole, but someone looking for one or the other is going to find just as much enjoyment. It's a really awesome little mystery to unravel, and the best part is, for most of you, there's going to be more to uncover after you beat it, prompting a second playthrough. Oh, and without spoiling anything, I absolutely have to give a nice tilt of the hat to one of the most effective fakeouts I've ever experienced in a video game story. I won't say more than that, but trust me on this one, it's genius. As far as gameplay is concerned, there is a lot to talk about here. 
I mean, without me saying much of anything, I imagine most people familiar with the survival horror genre have already put together how close this game stays to the accepted pillars of the genre's foundation. But just in case that isn't immediately jumping out at you, let's dive into why that is indeed the case. Before we do though, we've got to talk about what exactly those two words mean. You know the ones I'm talking about. Survival horror is a term that is talked about to no end. I mean, every article you read or tweet made about an upcoming horror game has got a 50-50 shot at including it, but no one seems to be able to actually define what that classification means, or at the very least, they're not able to do so without starting the sentence off with the words, it feels like. So let's go ahead and burn my comment section down right now and define exactly what I'm talking about here. Survival horror is an offshoot of the PC adventure game genre where loosely defined or subjective elements like isolation and horror meet more concrete gameplay components like a limited inventory, incremental exploration centered around backtracking, and a liberal use of puzzles blocking forward progress. A lot of times, these games will use a fixed perspective, leaving control of the camera out of the player's hands. This combined with the often difficult combat and limitations on what the player can carry with them culminate into a sort of amplification of the game's horror atmosphere. Since the only way to alter your view and get a good look at what lies ahead is to push forward into territory you're not quite sure is safe because you can't see it. And considering that encounters in these games can be very taxing on precious limited resources like ammunition or healing items, avoiding combat altogether becomes one of the more attractive options. Now I'm sure there's at least some of you out there shaking your head in disagreement and that's 100% fine. We can disagree about all kinds of stuff, but this isn't necessarily my opinion here. Capcom coined the term survival horror with the release of the first Resident Evil game, and if you're going to use that term, it's always going to refer to the game it was first used to describe. And you might argue that genres evolve, which they most certainly do, but at least in this context, evolution doesn't mean an absence of every single game design principle seen in its first iteration, and if it does, that means any game made under that umbrella in the past have retroactively had that genre stripped from them. Now, I went on that long diatribe because everything I just mentioned when describing survival horror is present and accounted for here in Signalis, which at first might be a little hard to believe given its very unique perspective for the genre. As you can see, Signalis uses a not quite top down, not quite isometric view and it's really easy to think a lot of those elements won't work in this kind of an environment, but that is very far from what's going on. And while this may not look like the type of camera angle you would get with a pre-rendered background Resident Evil type game, this is still very much a fixed perspective because the player is not able to actively control the camera except through the act of moving their character. And like other games in the genre, since the developers didn't have to design their levels around a camera that could theoretically be looking at things from a nearly infinite amount of angles, they were able to craft these incredibly detailed and believable backdrops. Of course, moving through those backdrops means possibly encountering resistance in the form of mutated replicas, and I can assure you that combat in this game will feel like second nature to fans of Resident Evil or Silent Hill. In its default configuration, Signalis uses a very familiar hold a shoulder button to aim and hit the action button to fire kind of setup, but they do have a few little tweaks thrown in here or there to keep things fresh. Since the game's viewing angle may make depth perception a little hard when aiming, guns have a visible laser sight and you can lock onto enemies which is represented by an on-screen indicator. You can move while shooting which is always nice to see, but as you might expect with a game like this, there is a trade-off there, which is the fact that you may not be able to hit what you're aiming at if you're also going on a bit of a backwards stroll. You can also get a hold of some secondary items that do a lot both in and outside of a fight. First, you've got the stun prods that you can use to, well, you know, stun your enemies. And then there's injectors that will automatically resuscitate you if you happen to die while one of them are equipped. Then there are the more utility-driven ones, like a flashlight or an eye replacement that'll let you take pictures of anything on screen. And let me assure you, this is a godsend if you don't happen to have a smartphone near you when trying to remember info necessary for solving a puzzle. There are also thermite flares that feed into a very cool little mechanic borrowed from the amazing Resident Evil 1 remake. 
The virus going around infects a replica's organic material, including its brain, but the more mechanical nature of these things mean that they don't die too easy. After putting one of these things down, you're only going to have a little while till it gets back up again, and it's going to take just as many hits to reintroduce to the grave. To keep this from happening, you can use these thermite flares since they burn hot enough to completely disable both the organic and metal parts of a replica, and as you might have already figured, these things come in a very, very short supply. So obviously, you're going to need to be very selective about when and where you use them. I found they worked best in two very specific situations. First off, if it's a route I knew I would need to retread often, or if it was a tight space where dodging attacks would be too hard to chance if these things got back up again. I feel like this was a great little addition, and outside of the Resident Evil remake and maybe Silent Hill 4, I can't think of too many other games that have used this expel a rare item to permanently get rid of a constant foe type of mechanic. Getting around this terrifying environment can be handled in the more traditional method, of course that being tank controls, but given the perspective of the game, I oddly enough found your more normal control layout to work a little better. And you don't have to say anything because I am also very disappointed to hear myself say that. Keeping in that same lane, Elster here feels pretty responsive and it's easy enough to get her to go where you want her to, but do keep in mind I really enjoy controlling old Resident Evil titles, so there very well may be something wrong with my brain. I'm also like 85% positive that the demo I played before launch had Elster running just a little faster than she does here in the final release, but I really don't care enough to install it again and check. Whether or not that was the case though, I would have liked to have seen just a little more speed when I held down that run button, but I do know any small adjustment on that end would have a supreme effect on the game's difficulty. Throughout my time with the game, I did run into a few scenarios where I felt like I took a cheap hit or two, and we will get into that, but 99% of the time I felt pretty good about my ability to bait enemies to one area of the screen and then bob and weave my way around them. As Signalis goes on, bad guys become more erratic with their movements and some of the replicas are able to flat out sprint at you, so even when you get good at dodging, the game can still throw surprises at you right up to the last boss. It seems to me the game was tailor-made to be experienced by someone who's using a controller, but at one point the DualSense wireless I was using died and I can confirm a mouse and keyboard are going to get the job done just fine as well. On a less mechanical level, Signalis works exactly how a survival horror fan would want it to. You explore small portions of a scary ass environment and in doing so collect items and solve puzzles that's going to gradually open up more of the area to be explored, which of course means more puzzles, items, and combat. It's a great little loop. What I really liked is how the game makes sure that puzzles don't feel too static. Sure, you're going to be looking at something like this a lot, but you're also going to need to make sure that you are closely examining key items in your inventory and you can also combine them with other stuff too. I've always really liked it when games include stuff like this. My brain is just sort of wired to only expect the more traditional reading a document and using sections of it as a cipher to help line up some mechanical thing, but since I knew the inventory wasn't off limits for puzzles here, I had to keep my proverbial head on a swivel. Of course, enemies are going to show up in increasing numbers to act as nice little barriers to progress and you can expectedly leave them alone, opting to dodge them or just spend your resources clearing out one specific route that you know you're going to take more than others. But when I did feel like going all Rambo, Signalis did a great job of giving me essentially enough ammo to deal with the enemies I wanted to without making me feel like I was flush with the stuff. Even though I'm positive I never once ran out of ammo for any of my guns during this playthrough, I spent the entire game feeling like I was on the verge of doing just that, which I think is a sign that, again, these people knew exactly what they were doing as far as survival horror is concerned. And I think what really drives home that nearly constant feeling of running out of resources is how Signalis heavily limits how much ammo you can fit in a single inventory slot. In games like Resident Evil, you might see similar limitations, but you can often stack hundreds of rounds of ammo and it's only going to take up as much space as a single bullet would. 
In Signalis, I could only ever carry 20 rounds of handgun ammo in a single slot and even less for the other guns. Now realistically, this isn't an actual hindrance because you could always just make a trip to the item box if you run low, but it has this cool psychological effect of keeping the constant tension of running out in the front of your mind. As usual with a survival horror game, I finished Signalis' last boss with an absolute armory of resources left over, but that didn't keep me from feeling like I was always on the verge of being defenseless anyways. If you ask me, that right there, for this genre, is like the gold standard for how you want your player to be feeling. And you know, I've mentioned the puzzles several times now, it's probably about time I actually talk about them. Now, I know the first thing you think of when someone mentions good game design likely isn't staring at a puzzle and trying to figure it out, but hot damn does Signalis have some absolutely killer head scratchers. There's the more baseline stuff you might expect, like flipping levers or filling tubes of water in just the right order. You know, the kind of industrial puzzle design that feels like something some power plant worker actually has to do on a daily basis. But there's also a nice selection of what I like to call Silent Hill style puzzles. Which is the kind of puzzle that'll have you gleaming some seemingly unimportant information from a document or scrap of paper and applying it to a riddle in order to get a solution. Things, however, go an extra dimension deeper with the inclusion of a radio you can access at any time. On top of it being cool that you can listen to this thing whenever you want and it keeps playing when you're outside the inventory, there's also several puzzles that will incorporate it into their design. For example, you might need to solve a little mini puzzle to figure out exactly what station to listen in on and then you might just catch the kind of old numbers broadcast that you'll find on any top 10 horror YouTubers channel at some point in time. Hell, you could just turn this thing on because you want to listen to it while you're playing. Or maybe I'll, I'll go ahead and, and turn it off for, for manly reasons, not because I find it terrifying and I'm not sure why. There was also a really nice little roadblock that had me triangulating a broadcast to figure out which antennas were still functioning and then sending out a very specific signal so that I could catch it on my radio and unlock a case that needed a certain song to be played for it to be opened. Like I said before, I know puzzles aren't exactly what get most people out of bed in the morning, but in this kind of game, it is a necessity, and I have no issues telling you that these are some of the best I've ever come across. They sit just on the border of the difficulty scale, right before things become too challenging and take too much time to figure out. Being able to play this game before anyone else had a chance to was a very interesting feeling for a small channel like mine, but it also came with the dread of knowing that if I did run into a puzzle that was too much for me to figure out, well, I was shit out of luck because no one had had a chance to write any guides or post on any forums for help yet. So I was on my own here, and man did that make for a satisfying feeling when I came up against a tough challenge and ended up thinking my way through it. Of course, everyone is going to have a different experience on that front, but I'm kind of an idiot, so I've got to assume you guys are going to be fine. I would suggest, if possible, trying to hold off on looking up any puzzle solutions when you get stumped. I myself had a few spots where I started to think this would be the one that got me, but the solution you need is always right there. You just have to know how to look for it. If you want my advice, just repeat this mantra to yourself. The more random and seemingly useless the information you come across, the more likely that it is you'll need it for a puzzle. Keep that in mind and make sure to stay on the lookout for any visual clues and you'll do just fine, I promise. And moving on to something that like 5% of you are even going to care about, I really enjoyed the inventory here in Signalis. It takes a very Silent Hill approach by sticking with a horizontal layout instead of Resident Evil's vertical orientation. Although, unlike SH, it is limited in size, so that does help play into the survival horror gameplay really well. Hitting the up or down direction will take you to your map, radio, or transcripts of anything you've read so far, and here is the kicker that will really get survival horror fans' ears perked up. You can access this file log at any time, even when you're currently looking at a puzzle. Man, talk about a seemingly small but massive innovation. How many times have you been struggling through a puzzle in a Silent Hill game and you need to keep quitting out so you can go into your inventory or even worse, go read some documents somewhere in the room? It's little stuff like this that'll seem like such a minuscule addition on the surface but end up adding so much to the genre rules we're all so used to. And I think that makes for a good example of what Rose Engine did here. 
I mean, clearly, yes, they were looking to make a survival horror game, and in doing so, there was going to be a need to, at the very least, recreate some of the work of others in the genre, but this game proves you don't need a direct one-to-one -one copy of the old PS1-era survival horror blueprints to do that, and that's a bigger feat than you might first think, because too far movement in any direction and you could either end up with a game that is far too derivative or one that misses the mark by a country mile. It seems to me these two really understood that, much like the way these games are played, sometimes progress forward in survival horror game design needs to come in a matter of inches. Too much and you risk totally altering the core experience of the genre. Too little and people will accuse you of producing something that's more of a copy than an homage. And if there is one thing you trust me on, make it this. Signalis is not just a way we old Resident Evil heads can get our survival horror fix, but it's also something new something fresh and interesting. Its style, look, gameplay, and overall atmosphere, while very much in league with what you would expect from a game under this banner, is different enough to be appreciated all on its own. I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I absolutely loved playing through Signalis this past week. I really lost myself in it and I absolutely could not recommend it anymore. It's just incredible. But like they say, to err is human, and this game was very much made by humans. So I'm going to get into some downsides, points of interest, and annoying bits that popped up during my gameplay, but I want to remind you of two very important things. First, like I already said, this is a game that I am very much willing to put my word behind. I am confident that those of you who enjoy the content of this channel will have a blast with Signalis even in the face of the stuff I'm about to get into. And second, this is what I experienced with a pre-release press build of the game, so there is a very good chance that some of the things I'm about to mention here will not even be something you'll need to worry about because they would have already been fixed. Alright, that being said, let's get down to the dirty business of being overly critical. Something you might have noticed I excel at. And starting off with the least problematic, we've got an issue where the prompt for opening doors, climbing down ladders, and just interacting with anything in the environment doesn't seem to extend to the area inside of the object. So technically, you could run into a door and pass the marker for opening it, meaning if you're too close to a door or item, you'll have to fiddle with the d-pad till you get Elster back far enough to reactivate that prompt. Now this probably isn't something that you'll run into for the first bit of time that you spend in a new area, but once you get to know your surroundings and start really traversing the place, you'll be running all the time, and even when I mashed the action button the entire time leading up to getting in front of the door, I would miss my opportunity like 15-20% of the time. Alright, so I had a whole section of this script, both written and voiced, about how this can lead to getting cheap shotted when running from enemies and how annoying it could be in a game where like half of the experience is entering and exiting doors. But before I wrote this script, I messaged Yuri, one half of Team Rose Engine, and let them know what I had run into, and literally 20 minutes ago they messaged back saying they just pushed out an update that'll take care of it. So you just got saved from not only having to experience that problem in the game, but also having to hear me piss and moan about it. That's a win-win. Continuing on, I also found aiming to be a little finicky using the default control settings. Like I mentioned before, Signalis uses a system that anyone who's even glanced at a copy of Resident Evil will know, and it does work well enough. Holding a shoulder button to aim and firing with the action button does exactly what you need it to, but thanks to the game's slightly angled perspective, you're going to need to do a lot of adjusting on the vertical axis to make sure your shots are going to land. Now that I think about it, that's not quite true, because as far as Elster is concerned, it's the horizontal axis, but as far as your perspective goes, it's vertical. I, that's a little too complex. You guys get what I'm trying to say, though. In order to deal with the quantum physics I've just discovered, the game uses an auto-aim system, and again, it works fine. It's just switching those auto-aim targets that gives me problems. In theory, you're supposed to use your right thumbstick to manually move your aim around, and when you get near an enemy, the auto-aim will kick in to stick your reticle to them, but in reality, this process can be a bit of a dice roll. Sometimes getting within a certain range would have my cursor locking on no problem, but sometimes it would pass right over a bad guy without even acting like it was going to lock on. On top of that, the default sensitivity for this thumbstick had my reticle flying across the room with the slightest bump of the stick. 
This problem is only amplified when trying to walk and aim at the same time. Moving seems to lessen how well the game's auto-aim can lock on, which I think sounds like a nice trade-off on the surface. It happens in all kinds of video games. Moving around lessens your ability to aim well. It seems like a good idea, but that's only true when the aiming works consistently while you're standing still. Now obviously this comes into play more when you start running into two or three replicas in an area, so it will take a while for it to get on your nerves, but eventually I decided to see if there was anything I could do in the options to lessen the annoyance. And there I found a toggle that changed how aiming works, which in my opinion should probably be the default. In this new mode, I no longer had to hold the shoulder button, but instead simply had to point the right analog stick in the direction I wanted to aim, and that's exactly where it went. It kind of functions the same way a top-down twin-stick shooter does. Auto-aiming still works the same way it did before, but for some reason this method just felt so much more natural to me. I mean, sure, it's not the traditional control style for combat in these games, but hey, it works. After doing this, I enjoyed combat way more, which is crazy because I already liked it. So if you find yourself struggling a bit, try switching to manual mode and see if it helps you as much as it did me. Hell, even if it is working for you, give it a shot. It's pretty damn fun. Of course, this only applies if you're going to be using a controller, but like I said before, it does sort of feel like this game was intended to be played with one. However, if you do decide to use a keyboard and mouse, I didn't find any issues whatsoever. It was pretty easy to use and intuitive to figure out, so you won't have any problems at all. And at the end of this list, we've got something that slightly borders outside of being a nitpick. Now to preface this, you guys know I spend a solid portion of each day ass deep in survival horror titles. I may not be massively good at video games as a whole, but if there's one thing I excel at, it's strategy. The kind of strategy that has you planning your next few moves before you've even left the save room. How much am I going to need in my inventory to get where I'm going, and how can I make that same trip but still account for coming across items I'm going to want along the way? It's a talent of mine, and I consider myself to be damn good at it. Well, I guess you guys do have access to my stream, so maybe let's dial that back to marginally okay. Alright, so that being said, I felt like I had to return to the save room and drop items off in the item box way too often in my playthrough. It was like a two steps forward and one step back kind of scenario. I would set out with a bunch of empty spaces in my inventory and find a new room, then I would collect a few things and like clockwork, before I got to the key item in there, I would always run out of space. So then I would have to trek back to the item box to clear out space, then go back and get the key item, which almost always was meant for a later puzzle, which means, yep, another trip back to the item box. As the game went on, this process became more and more frequent, and by the end, it felt like I had to repeat the same ritual for every room I came across. And this was all going on with me carrying only one single weapon, one box of ammunition for it, and a single flashlight, which is required for a lot of areas in the game. I almost never had healing items on me because I never had space for them. I mean, sure, I could have left the ammo in the save room, but dying in a fight I could have survived if I had access to more than one magazine is just as frustrating as walking back and forth between item boxes. One thing that made this even worse is that the map only tracks rooms by whether or not you've been in them before. So once I found a new room, I would have to leave and dump my items before picking up the last few MacGuffins. On the way back though, that room would look like any other room on the map, and the areas you explore here can be pretty damn big. Also keep in mind, I stood a good chance of the enemies I had already downed getting back up again during one of these trips. So there was a lot working against me here, making things a little more difficult than I would typically like. Now in the developer's defense, they do offer an option to trash items right there on the spot, and to a normal functioning brain, that sounds like a solution to my problem. Well, that is most certainly not what I have in my head, because the RE fan in me just wouldn't allow me to dump healing items or ammo. Despite the fact that I finished the game with so much of both, I could probably start the game again and not have to pick anything up. I feel like there are a few possible ways something like this could be avoided. The first thing that comes to mind would be the most obvious, just add a few more item slots. I'd say even a single additional inventory space might have pulled me out of this kind of situation at least half the times it happened to me. 
Barring that, maybe have equipped weapons or secondary items like flashlights, stun rods, or flares not take up space in the inventory once they're equipped. Or maybe you could do neither of those things and give the player either an option to drop items where they stand a la RE0 or mark key items on the map when the player comes across them the same way it does for puzzles. At least that way, getting back to the room they're contained in would be a little easier after dumping items off. Now I do understand that any of these options could have dire consequences concerning the game's tight survival horror design, but I think there's definitely a solution there somewhere within the margins. Regardless though, I want you guys to know that nothing listed here came anywhere close to ruining this experience. If anything, you could think of these issues as a few near microscopic mosquitoes splatting up against an otherwise pristine windshield. This is a game that I am incredibly glad I got to play, and when I'm done with this video, best believe I will be playing through it one more time. I loved nearly every second of Signalis. Even when it was pissing me off, it was only doing that because I wanted so bad to keep moving forward and see what new mysteries I'd find in the shadows. I mean, come on, it's not every day you get to play a survival horror game that you could spend more than 10 hours in. Well, I guess now that I think about it, it's not every day you get to just play a survival horror game. I think when it all comes down to it, I'm most excited that Signalis gives me a killer little narrative world to experience that old school style of survival horror gameplay in. But if I had to pick a second most exciting thing about the game, it would be the absolutely eye-melting style dripping from every crevice of it. In my original video covering Signalis' demo, I described it as an intersection between Dead Space, Ergo Proxy, and Tsutomu Nihei, and since that video released, I've been racking my brain for a more apt description, and I'll level with you, I don't think one exists. From the Dead Space side of things, we get that rundown, sort of retro future vibe. Even though this is a world that has developed the tech to make sentient machines and colonize other planets, people still seem to use CRT monitors, and their computers resemble old PC-8800s or maybe an MSX. The original Dead Space's reliance on that brown color scheme often gets replicated too, although when it does, it seems like this is more of a nod towards Silent Hill's other world with its rusted chain link kind of design. Like I said, I also see Ergo Proxy in there, and that's thanks to the sort of post-goth, dystopic uniformity to things. And I mean that both literally and figuratively. Everything in the world is wearing some kind of a uniform, which I guess would make sense. After all, we are mainly dealing with machines mass-produced to serve very specific purposes. I imagine you'd want a quick way to differentiate your replicas meant for digging in the mines from the ones who are supposed to be taking care of administrative tasks. The environments you explore, if you look past their mangled, destroyed state, seem to point towards a similar approach to uniformity and design. Everything seems to reflect a sort of impersonal, industrial aesthetic where individualistic touches like decorations are foregone for a big focus on utilitarianism. Each room you walk into seems to most efficiently serve whatever purpose it's been assigned to and nothing much else. The scant few areas you'll come across that look to contain at least some personal flair reflect a very cold kind of feeling. Like they were put together by an assembly line robot working off of some predictive algorithm aimed at mimicking human interior design. And the Satomu Nihei influences should be pretty clear even if you've only caught a passing glance at something like Biomega or Blame. In both works, we see a black leather and industrial look to outfits that give off the feeling of brief glimpses of humanity breaking through a filter of mechanical accessories. There's also a very cool reliance on negative space to punctuate the outline of the more human forms and draw the eye to the pipes and electrical conduits that surround them. And if you're geriatric enough to have lived through the 90s like me, you're likely to see some Peter Chung in there as well. Honestly, I would be very surprised if at least one of the devs at Rose Engine weren't a fan of Aeon Flux. Moving away from possible influences though, we have to talk about what a departure this is for the genre. As the years have gone by, we've seen a lot of takes on survival horror, but traditionally they've stayed within a certain realm as far as their presentation goes. Of course, pre-rendered backgrounds may no longer be a mainstay, much to my chagrin, but the overall aesthetic remains largely unchanged. Well, Signalis bucks that trend with its nearly top-down perspective and low-res 3D that's so aliased it might as well be sprite-based. 
And I really mean that by the way. When I first saw the trailer for this game, I just thought these were 2D sprites with incredibly fluid animations. And the same goes for the inventory. Look at these images of your items. You get the feeling that you're looking at a 2D image until it starts spinning around on you. The environment seems to be mostly 2D with low res 3D objects thrown on top. I say that because I noticed the light from my flashlight was altered believably when cast on objects with differing heights and shapes and the rest of the environment just did not have the same effect. Also as a fun little plus, firing your gun shows real time accurate shadow casting for stuff like pillars or furniture, something that's always appreciated but you don't really expect in a game that looks like this. Artistically speaking, this style just flat out gels with me. It's this awesomely dark look that seems to be both dystopian and clean at the same time. Everyone's wearing suits that wouldn't be out of place in an episode of Gaunts, and your surroundings are cold and isolating. It had this sort of uncanny effect that the Resident Evil 1.5 build also had on me, where everything was recognizable as a sort of everyday location that should have a lot of people in it, but not seeing anyone around causes this lonely dysphoria. One thing I really got into though was how consistent the visual themes are applied here. The retro future approach can be seen represented everywhere from computers and radios to your in-game map and even your inventory screen. Everything has a wonderfully realized aesthetic that I can only describe as the way people from the 80s thought the future would look. Kind of like technology kept increasing in complexity and usefulness but retained the same visual look it had back when personal computers first started shipping with actual hard drives in them. Essentially, everything in the game feels like you're viewing it through an uncalibrated interlace screen that's constantly displaying command line code. The lighting is pristine with great looking shadows cast by overhead lights and the muzzle flash from your gun and infected replicas have these glitchy visuals happening all around them, kind of like their infection is distorting how you're seeing them with your mechanical eyes. Very cool effect. Now I'm definitely into the perspective here, but throughout the game you will get a few opportunities to shift to first person which I think really livens things up a bit. There are the sections where you can interact with stuff like puzzles or examining something and these give off a heavy point and click adventure game vibe which I always really like. Being able to look around and interact with stuff via a little cursor on the screen just adds this nice flair to the total package here and the amount of detail in these departures never fails to impress me. Also you get a close up look at this world's tech which is just really cool. There are also short sections that play out from a first person perspective and gives you full control over your movements. These areas are visually moody with great lighting and the same low resolution alias 3D that's seen everywhere else which you should read as amazing. In fact, after spending a bit of time in this train flashback, I'm just dying to see Rose Engine make a full 3D game off of this aesthetic. While most of your playthrough will be spent looking at relatively pristine, sanitary interior designs, towards the end the infection raging through the mining facility will cause these organic growths to show up all over and it looks awesome in my opinion. Near the end you'll also notice a move towards a very otherworld kind of look. Rusted metal, chain link grates, and a heavy shift towards deep red in the environment matched with garish yellow lighting. It's a very Silent Hill 1 look and that is exactly the compliment it sounds like. Secondary stuff like animations and the run cycle look great to my eye with my only complaint being the stomp you can deliver to downed enemies. It feels like there should have been a little more movement here as it looks like Elster's just barely lifting her leg but other than that I'm very happy with how all of this looks in motion. I really enjoyed the layout and look of the inventory screen and the way it's organized seems to make it pretty intuitive to navigate which is important in a game like this. The game often shows off some killer looking cutscenes that can rapidly switch between 2D sprite art and 3D which is awesome to see in motion. The art style here is very anime influenced and the sharp pixels make for an incredibly attractive look. And like a lot of other indie games that are trying to emulate that retro look, Signalis has a CRT filter in the options. And I really liked it, despite the fact that I'm typically not a big fan of stuff like this. It believably softens the image and adds a bit of the kind of fisheye distortion you would get from actually displaying this game on an old CRT TV. Honestly, this is how I would have played the game if I weren't capturing footage for a video. I tried out a test upload with some footage of the game using the CRT mode and YouTube's compression had it looking far less attractive than it actually is in person. But I'm really happy they included it because when I replay the game this is exactly how I'm going to look at it. So if you're the kind of weirdo that can't stand looking at sharp pixels and aliased images, once you get out of the psych ward, don't worry, Signalis has got you covered. 
Moving away from Signalis' look for a bit, I have to mention its absolutely killer soundtrack. I could definitely hear some Akira Yamaoka inspiration in there, with a few very industrial tracks punctuated by heavy clanging sounds arranged into a type of melody. Mostly the style is relegated to the combat sections, but every once in a while you'll hear that same metallic percussion heavy aesthetic somewhere else. However, unlike Yamaoka's later work on Silent Hills 2 and 3, Signalis' music is mostly devoid of your more traditional song structure. Most of the non-action-packed tracks seem to focus on long, synthy, ambient tones that give off a very soothing feel, which I would say perfectly fits the tone of the places that you'll hear them in. Of course, the game's also trying to spook you out, so there are plenty of tracks that will have that slightly off kind of sound that subconsciously gives you the feeling that things aren't quite right. These tracks have a lot of low droning in them with peaks of sudden jumps to higher notes. Basically what I'm saying is this is not the kind of music you listen to outside of the game when you're looking for that typical verse, pre-chorus, chorus, 4-4 chorus, four -four song structure. Melodies in a lot of the music here don't exactly repeat, but instead they're drawn out for long periods, slightly changing over time until they end with a totally different sound in the same key. It feels very appropriate for the setting and fits the overall feel of the game so well it's crazy. Honestly, my only complaint is that the music doesn't make it into the game enough. Mostly when you're just walking around and exploring, instead of music you'll have ambient tones layered to create a sort of soundscape that resembles the place you're currently in. Honestly, for a good chunk of the game, you're going to be listening to something that sounds a lot like the kind of high-pitched hum that electronics give off while they're running. Don't get me wrong, it is very immersive, but its overall volume is pretty low compared to the rest of the game and I would just love to hear some of the more melodic stuff more often. Plus, the lack of percussion in most of these tracks can have a sort of droning effect if you've been listening to it for a long time and you probably will be. Regardless though, this game has some incredible sound design and its music is most definitely one of its high points. And when you consider how good of a package this is overall, that is really saying something. Well guys, there's not much left to say here that I haven't already said. Signalis is an amazingly fresh look at the survival horror genre, and even if these types of games weren't so rare, it would still be just as interesting. Its look, sound, and gameplay all just ooze a real attention to style and detail, and I truly can't recommend it enough. It's releasing on PC and major consoles, including the Switch, so hit pause on this video and grab yourself a copy. It's really that good. Outside of its general quality though, I would say there's something a little more important going on here. On top of this being a very high quality video game that is worthy of a purchase in its own right, it's about damn time we show the market exactly what we want from it. If the AAA industry isn't interested in catering to us anymore, that's totally fine. We'll take the money we would have spent there and give it to smaller developers who are willing to release the games we've been wanting to play for years. And that goes for other quality titles too. Go grab yourself a copy of Alyssa and Tormented Souls. It's about time we started voting with our wallets. Listen, I know I've been hammering on this subject a lot lately, but I really cannot get over this new survival horror explosion. We went from having literally no games in the genre to play for years to actually having to choose which survival horror game we're going to buy from month to month. It really is a great time to be alive for people like us, and if you want to see this trend grow and affect much higher budget games, it's time to show them exactly how much money they could be making. So if you know of a small developer working on a project like this, follow them on Twitter, share their trailers, and help build hype around their games. Support their work and do everything you can to show it to like-minded people. Hell, feel free to list it in the comments section below so I can know about it too. Let's help turn this short boom into a lasting trend in the industry. If you've been watching this channel or channels like mine for a while, I've got to imagine more of these games is exactly what you're looking for and it's about time we did our part to make sure that happens. And on that inspirational note, I think it's about time for me to get back to work. I hope to see each and every one of you again in the next one, but until then, as usual, I'm Jared and this is Avalanche Reviews. 
well, 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 look who it is. You know, after conducting a very long double-blind study, the data seems to indicate that only the most sexually attractive, desirable people make it to the end of my videos, so congrats on that. If you like survival horror, I've got a few videos on screen that you'll probably also like, and if you want to support more work just like this, I have a Patreon linked on screen, as well as the YouTube Partnership Program down below the video. However, if that's not in the cards for you, very understandable, a like, comment, or share will do just as much good, I assure you. Well guys, I love you all very much, stay safe, and I'll see you all again next time. Peace out.